This video segment takes a more in-depth review of recovering data from an optical disc using the Optical Disc Reviver built by Silicon Forensics. As you have seen in the overview segment, the Optical Disc Reviver was specifically designed to help the forensic examiner recover data from an optical disc that had been damaged or possibly deleted. In this segment, I will cover evidence handling, the physical layout of the optical disc, the function of the ATIP data, proper techniques to clean the media, and details on the disk swap recovery process to recover data. It's one thing for a suspect to damage a disk, but the last thing you want to do as an examiner is cause any damage. This is a good time to discuss evidence handling. If you need to mark a CD as evidence, it is safe to write anywhere on the top label with a water-based marker. Look for markers labeled as CD markers. Do not use solvent-based markers as they can penetrate the lacquer layer and damage the reflector. You can also write in the clamping ring area. Never use a ballpoint pen to write on the label. The pressure on the label could easily pass through to the lacquer and reflector layers and permanently damage the disc. It is also a good practice to photograph all discs from the label side as part of the initial evidence processing. If you need to fingerprint a disc, fingerprints should be processed with powder and photography. Do not use lift tape or super glue. Now let's cover the physical layout of a CDR disc. A CDR consists of different layers of materials. Starting at the bottom, the first layer is an injection molded piece of clear polycarbonate plastic. The plastic is impressed with bumps that form a single long spiral track. A dye layer is on top of the plastic. If this was a CDRW, a metallic alloy that is used instead of a dye. The alloy is bi-stable, which allows the state to be changed many times. A thin reflective layer covers the dye layer. A lacquer layer is applied over the reflective layer to protect it. And finally, a label is printed on top. The optical drive reads data by directing laser energy through the polycarbonate plastic. Data is represented by blocking the path to the reflector by using a dye or bi-stable metallic alloy. As I mentioned earlier, a scratch from the top into the lacquer layer can damage the reflector which can corrupt the data. The single spiral track of data circles from the inside of the disk to the outside. If this spiral track was unwound, it would stretch about 3.7 miles long. This single track contains pits and lands in a groove. The pits and lands change the frequency of the laser in the drive that reads the groove, which interprets them as ones and zeros. A blank CDR is not completely blank. There is a hidden data track which is located at the beginning of the disk. This area is referred to as a tip. The pre-groove helps the writing laser to stay on track and to write the data to the disk at a constant rate. Maintaining a constant rate is essential to ensure proper size and spacing of the pits and lands burned into the dye layer. The ATIP also contains information about the manufacturer, the dye used, and the media information, such as disk length and speed. By looking at this generic disk that does not have any type of labeling, I cannot tell what type of disk it is, or speed. A third party tool that can read the ATIP data is Neuro Disk Speed. By selecting the Disk Info tab, it will read the 24 byte ATIP data and decode it. I can see that this disk is a 48 speed CDR. As you will see later, this information will be helpful during the recovery process. A disk that is seized from a suspect may be scratched or just plain filthy and that could cause delays in reading the data. If the disk is dirty and cannot be read properly, you will need to clean it. The first step to cleaning the disk is to use distilled water. Dry the disk with a soft lint-free cloth in a straight line, not in a circular motion. If water does not clean the disk, use a diluted solution of ivory soap or other pure soap with distilled water. Do not use any type of detergent or dish soap. Again, dry the disc with a soft, lint-free cloth in a straight line, not in a circular motion. A disc buffing tool can also be used to clean a disc after the above methods have failed. In our disc recovery scenario today, you have a generic disc that you received as potential evidence in a case. The disc was dirty, so you cleaned it. 
Even after cleaning, you see that the disc is badly scratched at the beginning of the disc. By looking at the disc, you see a discoloration on the disc starting from the middle and going outwards. This discoloration is caused by a change in the dye as data is written to the disc. Based on your training and experience, you believe there is data on the disc. However, when you insert the disc in the drive, the drive indicates the media is blank. You want to image the disc, but you cannot because the drive thinks the disc is blank. If the drive interprets the disc as blank, it will not allow you to read it any further. At this point, you need to trick the drive into allowing you to continue. This is where the disc swap technique comes into play. It is a simple workaround that involves putting a good disc with data in the drive and then swapping the disc with the bad disc. The drive still thinks the good disc is in the drive while you are really imaging the bad disc. The problem you had to overcome was how to get a disc out of the drive without the drive discovering you just swapped discs. As soon as you open the drive tray, the drive automatically scans the new disc when you insert it. In the past, I modified a standard DVD drive by taking it apart. Since the cover was off, I could easily swap the discs without having to open the tray. I have taken this drive apart so you can see what that looks like. You had to be careful though since the disc was spinning without a cover and you had an exposed laser. The optical disc reviver solved that condition. I can now use the disc swap technique safely with the built-in feature of stopping the drive from spinning when I make the swap. The suspect disc that I want to image is generic and does not have a label. First I take a disc that is similar to the suspect disc. Since I will be swapping discs, I want the drive to operate at the correct speed for the suspect disc. Since it does not have a label, I read the ATIP data on the suspect disc and discover that it is a 48 speed CDR. I find a new disc that is similar and this is what I refer to as my dummy disc. I need to put data on my dummy disc, so I fill it with a single file that is 700 megabytes in size. I can easily create this file using a freeware tool called Dummy File Creator. I then burn that file to my dummy disk. I open the tray of the optical disk reviver and insert the dummy disk. When I close the tray, Windows properly detects the disk and the large volume of data on the disk. Perfect! I have also started my favorite imaging software called IsoBuster Pro. Here IsoBuster sees the drive and the data. Now I press the bypass button on the front of the drive. As you see, the two lights on the front of the drive are flashing like a train crossing. The first thing this does is tell the drive to stop the disc from spinning. Once the spinning stops, the tray ejects my dummy disc. However, the drive still thinks that my disc is inserted. I remove the dummy disc and insert the suspect disc. Pressing the bypass button or gently pushing the tray will close the tray. The red lights alternate flashing, which means the drive is in the bypass mode and is ready. Now we are ready to image. To make my image, I use the create IBP file. What this allows me to do is start the imaging process and stop it if necessary. I can later restart the process from where it left off. This imaging process will take a long time as IsoBuster is trying to read the beginning of the disk which is damaged. After so many failed attempts to read the damaged block of data, it moves to the next block. The number of attempts can be set in the options of IsoBuster. Once it gets past the damaged blocks, IsoBuster starts to image the data. Now that IsoBuster completed the imaging task, I'm going to open the IBP file that I created. I select Open As Is. Now I have IsoBuster go through and try to recover file name entries along with carving files out, and I end up with successfully recovering the suspect's data.